want to acknowledge um, my co-authors here, Andrew Pomeroy, Michael Kinsella and Thomas Murray. And the work I'm presenting here was about trying to understand what the coastal geoscience and engineering community in Australia really thought were the key research priorities and the emerging issues for our discipline. So the first question you might ask is, well, why would we spend time doing this? There are lots of unanswered science questions. I'm sure everyone here has lots of things that they want to go and investigate in, in the science or engineering world that they work in. So why would we spend time actually identifying research priorities? Well, first of all, we're seeing increasing impacts on our coastal communities. We're seeing expansion of our coastal communities. The density of our coastal communities is increasing. The population in our coastal regions is increasing. And as a result of that, we're seeing increasing impacts from hazards, from coastal processes, and from the dynamics that we see in the coastal region. I've grabbed a few photos off the internet. It's pretty easy to go online, search for coastal hazards, you know, inundation, erosion, and so on. Um, this photo here is Lake Macquarie, which is about half an hour south of where I am now. And uh, you can see that the water level here is, is pretty close to the level of a large number of these properties. And Lake Macquarie is actually the most exposed estuary in New South Wales in terms of inundation hazards. This is Colora Narrabeen during the 2016 storm when there was significant beach erosion and you can see the impacts of waves affecting these properties. And more recently, this was the impact of erosion at Wombrel. So these are all New South Wales specific examples, but we can easily find equivalent examples for any other state or territory in Australia, aside from the ACT. Um, in addition to the increasing impacts on coastal communities, we see increasing impacts of climate change. So we're seeing these things start to eventuate, you know, these things that we've been reading about for a long time. And so we really need to start to think about, okay, how are we going to deal with these things? So what we need is a real coordinated effort to prioritize plan and implement adaptation measures and inform our coastal policy and management. So in essence, we need to take the best of our science and use it to inform our coastal management to make sure that we're looking after these environments. So one of the goals of this work was to identify key research priorities and research enabling activities to address these major challenges. Um, and I'll sort of probably uh, switch between talking about research activities or research priorities, and it will become clear a little bit later why that's the case. Um, but here we're talking about research enabling activities as things that are not directly uh, actual research questions, but things that make research easier or facilitate research. We wanted to develop a collective disciplinary perspective. It's all well and good for me to sit down and write down what I think the research priorities for Australia are, but that's not very useful for most people because my view doesn't necessarily represent the community. Um, and so the idea of developing a collective perspective really allows you to say, well, these priorities represent the views of the Australian coastal geoscience and engineering community. And as everyone here is probably well aware, we're working in a resource limited setting, whether that be uh, limited funding, limited personnel, limited time, we can only do so much. So because we can only do so much, having direction for where we take our research, and which things are most critical in terms of uh, which things will drive the biggest uh, outcomes for coastal management is really important. And ultimately, we hope that the outcomes of this work will result in a more strategic approach to funding coastal geoscience and engineering research so that the things that are most critical in terms of what the community sees as the key priorities are actually the things that are funded. So I'm sure you've all looked at uh, results of grant outcomes and thought, well, that's all well and good, but actually, is that really important? Is that really going to address the key things that are most important? And so we hope that this research will will result in a more strategic approach to funding um, research in the coastal geoscience and engineering sphere. But ultimately, what we want is we want the outcomes of this work to lead to better solutions for improved coastal management. 
So, you know, we don't want to see situations like this. This is Stockton, just on the northern side of the Hunter River here in Newcastle. Um, and this is a caravan park. So these buildings are relatively mobile, but this is an example of what we're seeing up and down the coast. And we want to see things, we want to see improved coastal management options rather than these sort of reactive responses like we're seeing here in this image. So one of the first things we had to do was say, well, okay, what's the scope of what we're doing? What, where does coastal geoscience and engineering start and where does it end? And we ended up defining it really as the physical processes and environmental changes that occur at the land-sea interface. And, of course, there is uh, quite a breadth of definition there and, you know, different people will define the land-sea interface as on different spatial and temporal scales but uh, it at least gives us a starting point so that we could identify things that people submitted as priorities as part of this process that were really just outside the scope of what we were talking about. So we've got a list here of people who we would consider coastal geoscience and engineering uh, researchers and practitioners, and they cover things like coastal oceanography, sedimentary geology, geomorphology, geochemistry, sedimentology, engineering, coastal zone management, and communication. And we've included things like coastal zone management and communication in this uh, project scope because that's actually how we drive outcomes, by having these people involved in this community. And to give you a bit of a graphic, this is what we came up with, with um, some input from some of the survey responses in terms of what coastal geoscience and engineering entails. You know, and it's everything from river to mid ocean stuff, it's you know, beach nourishment to seagrass and it's marine geology to the cultural values that we experience on the coast. So it covers a really broad range of um, spheres in terms of understanding the coastal environment as a whole. So we took an approach that was an adaptation of an existing method that's used for collaborative research priority setting in the literature. So it's an established method but we kind of added it and modified it to our needs. So the first stage of our process was a survey to generate initial priority activities. So we asked the coastal geoscience and engineering community, we sent out a survey and said, please respond to these questions. And the questions were, first of all, some demographics. We asked people about what their gender was, career stage, location, employment sector, um, we asked people their age, a few other things like that. We asked people to enter up to 10 priority research activities that they thought should be addressed over the next five to 10 years. And we gave people a little bit of um, a boundary in the sense that we said, you know, they've got to be sort of project scale things, you know, things that can be addressed with, you know, a few people, so three to five people over a three to five year period. We're not talking about something that's going to take 100 people 10 years or something that's going to take one person one month. So we're going for that kind of middle ground there, the kind of thing that you might fund through a research grant. And then the third sort of main question we asked people was, does the infrastructure and equipment exist to address these challenges? So it's all well and good to say, oh, we need to understand how um, a surf zone bar moves in the surf zone during a storm. And you say, well, that's well and good, but unless we can identify where the bar is, and have more continuous morphological measurements through the surf zone, through the storm, which we can't currently do, we can't actually address that challenge. So that's what that third question is trying to get at. So we had 161 complete responses to the survey and we only took complete responses. We didn't take any responses where people kind of dropped out halfway through the survey. Um, and in response to the second two questions there, we had 705 priority research activities submitted and we had 192 infrastructure and equipment responses submitted. So we had nearly a thousand responses to go through. And these varied from one word responses like money to very long and lengthy responses about, you know, we need to better understand how temperate carbonate reefs produce sediment and how that exchanges with beaches. So we had everything from really broad responses right down to very, very detailed responses. So the second stage of the survey was about coming up with a sort of more consolidated list. 
So the first thing we did, and this was done by the uh, author team from this paper, was we sorted these priority activities into categories. So we categorized, you know, all the things associated with coastal engineering together, all the things associated with modeling together. We came up with just some really broad categories. We then held a workshop uh, that we held during the uh, International Waves workshop in Melbourne in November 2019, and we invited anyone who wanted to come along who was at that workshop to come and spend an evening at the pub um, with a list of priority activities in one or two categories um, and to consolidate them and to say, okay, well, these three kind of say the same thing. We could come up with a single priority activity that represents these three or four responses. And I know that there are some of um, the people who attended that workshop on the, um, in the session today, so thank you for your time and effort for contributing to this project. And then the author team took all the results from uh, that workshop and reviewed and refined again, because what we found was that, you know, there were some things that, for example, sat in two different categories. So something might have been in the modeling category that we also saw in the engineering category. And so we sort of had to make some um, executive decisions about which category things belong to, whether or not there was too much overlap between different activities, whether they were sufficiently different and so on. So after that stage two process, we had a final priority list that had seven categories and 74 priority research and research in aid enabling activities spread across those seven categories. So we've gone from nearly a thousand down to 74 in this stage one and stage two process. And we really made sure within that stage two process that prior the priorities were structured to be achievable at the project level I mentioned before. So we're talking here a small number of researchers or stakeholders in some cases for some of the priorities uh, in a sort of three to five year uh, period of time. So then the last stage was another survey. So we went back out to the coastal geoscience and engineering community and we presented the community with these 74 priorities and we said, can you rank them? So we presented people with each category in turn and people were asked to rank each priority activity from no, it's not a priority, it shouldn't be included in the list. And then on a, or on a scale of one to five. One being, well, not very important, to five being absolutely critical, we need to deal with this tomorrow. Um, and we had 132 people complete that stage three survey. And then the last stage of the process was taking all of that data from uh, stage one, stage two, and stage three, and synthesizing it to come up, to get our refined list of priorities, and to look at the rankings of the priorities, both within the categories and between the categories. So just a little bit of an aside in terms of the people who responded to the survey, we had about, we had exactly a quarter of survey respondents identify as female, nearly uh, three quarters male and, and a couple of percent prefer not to say. And this roughly matches up with the data that we have from other studies in terms of what the gender breakdown is in coastal geoscience and engineering. So we feel that in terms of gender, at least, our survey is relatively representative of the community. Career level, we asked people, uh, student, junior, mid-level, senior, or prefer not to say. Um, we didn't actually give anyone a definition as to what junior meant versus senior versus mid-level. Um, and so these were self-reported career levels. And you can see that we've got a real dominance. We've got 80% of people identifying as mid-level and senior. So that may have an impact on the results of this in that we're not getting a huge representation of students and junior um, Coastal, coastal geoscientists and engineers responding to the survey. We had a pretty um, good representation of the location of people around Australia. We had a dominance of people from New South Wales and Queensland, uh, followed by uh, Western Australia and Victoria, with smaller representations from the other states and territories. 50% of our survey respondents identified themselves as researchers, whether that was basic or applied research. And then we had a number of people working for NGOs, we had policy makers, um, and a, a large proportion of other. About half worked in universities or research followed by state government, local government, and federal government. Um, with about 10% of people uh, responding to our survey identifying as coming from consultancies. 
And in general, our survey respondents were very well educated. More than half had doctorates, had 20% master's degree and 20% bachelor's degree. So in the vast majority were well qualified. So that's a little bit of an aside about the people who responded to our survey. So coming back to the research priorities. As I mentioned, we had a final priority list of seven categories with 74 priority research and research enabling, enabling activities spread across those categories. And the key thing I want to stress here is that of those 74 uh, activities that we presented to people, 91% of them scored a score of greater than three out or more out of five from more than three quarters of respondents. So what this tells us is the vast majority of these activities are seen as things that we need to do by the community. So we feel very comfortable saying that these 74 activities are actually 74 priorities. They're not just things to do, they're important things to do. So I think that's a really key takeaway is when you look through this list of 74 priorities or 74 activities is that really the vast majority of them are seen as priorities by the community. In terms of the breakdown of priorities in each category, we didn't have an even split between each category. Some had far more responses than others or some more priorities in them than others. For example, coastal hazards and climate change had 17 priorities, while the sort of communication and collaboration category only had five. So there's not an even split between the different categories. The other thing to note is that not every category ranked same. So in general, these are listed in uh, order of increasing mean score from bottom to top. So overall, the data collection and collation category had the highest average score across all the categories, while the engineering solutions uh, category had the lowest average score. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, engineering solutions are less important, but one of the things we identified, and I'll talk more a little bit about this later, is that things like data collection and collation are really foundational. They feed into so many other things. You know, if you have more data about ocean waves, that then allows you to better predict things like wave runup. It allows you to better predict coastal erosion. It allows you to do a whole bunch of other things. And so it feeds into lots of things and so is much more likely to be seen as important by a much wider range of people. And what we saw is that there were some categories that had significantly higher means than others. Now, I'll talk you through this uh, plot because it's not entirely straightforward to start with. What we have here is a single circle for each pair of categories. So we've got seven categories here. So there are a whole bunch of different pairs. So, for example, and I hope people can see my mouse. Maybe I'll just get a, a pointer. Up. So this uh, circle here that I'm indicating with represents the paired mean of the data category and the engineering category. So data had a mean score a bit above 3.9 and engineering had a mean score of 3.6 something. And this diagonal line, if the diagonal line doesn't intersect the one-to-one -one line, it means it's so the data category has a significantly higher mean score than the engineering category. It also has a significantly higher mean score than the dynamics category, as well as the infrastructure category and the modeling category. But it doesn't have a significantly higher mean score than the hazards category, which is indicated by red and by the fact that this diagonal line intersects the one-to-one -one line. So you can see there that their particularly data and the hazards category had significantly higher mean scores than the other categories that we saw here. So coming back to what some of these research priorities are, I'm just going to go through some examples. I'm not going to go through all 74. We'd be here for a really long time. But to give you a bit of a feel of what some of them were. So one of them was obtain novel measurements of waves, water levels, and currents during extreme conditions, for example, during tropical cyclones, and explore extreme tales of event and impact occurrence. So you could imagine this would be something that could be the sort of framing or basis of a research project for a couple of years that could be done by a couple of people. And, you know, obviously with all of these, you could ask how long is a piece of string, but you could certainly make some inroads into something like this in that time period with that amount of effort. 
The second example here, quantify with greater accuracy the nearshore hydrodynamic processes that contribute to coastal inundation, including wave runup, wave setup, dune overtopping, and estuarine inundation. So again, you could make inroads into a priority like that with a few people over a few years. And lastly, quantify the impacts of coastal hazards and climate change on coastal infrastructure. Again, you know, this just gives you a bit of a feel for what some of the priorities were. If we look more uh, in depth into one category, uh, here we're looking at the coastal dynamics and processes category, and we've got 13 different priorities within this category. And these um, priorities listed here that are numbered, they're numbered in order from highest weighted mean score to lowest weighted mean score. And they're a shorter version of the full priority. So you can have a read of the full priorities in the paper if you would so wish. And what this, this diagram shows a few things. So the first thing it shows is the breakdown of scores, which is the horizontal bar. So you can see that, um, and this is the bottom x-axis, I should say. So this top category, quantify shoreline change over varying spatial and temporal scales, 50% or so of respondents rank that a five or above, as indicated by this darkest blue colour. Another, oh, what's that, 30% ranked at a four, and another maybe 10 or 15% ranked at a three. So it's a really large portion of people ranking this as a really high priority. We can then look at what the mean score and one standard deviation is, which is this light gray circle and horizontal line. And we can compare that to the category mean, which is this vertical gray dash line and the standard deviation, which is this shaded gray bar back here. But one of the things that we were interested in doing was looking at, well, how many people ranked it a five? How many people gave it a greater than three score? Because that really indicates people think this is something that is really important. So we came up with a weighted mean score, which, which is the mean score uh, times by the proportion of scores greater than three times the proportion of scores that were fives. And that's these black and yellow dots here. And then the category what mean weighted mean is this vertical black dash line and the standard deviation of those category weighted means is this dark gray shaded area. And so you can see that of the 13 categories, there are two that have weighted means as shown by these yellow dots that are greater than one standard deviation away from this category weighted mean. So we really define these as being the ones that were seen as most critical within this category. And so for this category, coastal dynamics and processes, the two that are seen as the most important are to quantify shoreline change over varying spatial and temporal scales and to investigate the initial hydrodynamic processes that contribute to inundation. So that's a bit of a feel for what the kind of results we got out for each single category were. So there are seven of these categories. I'm only going to talk through one because of time constraints. If we look through each of the categories and look at what the top priority from each category is, we get a really interesting picture. So in terms of the data category, the top priority was to obtain novel hydrodynamic measurements during extreme conditions. So that's something that the community feels we don't have enough of. In the dynamics category, we just talked through it, it's about quantifying shoreline change. In the modeling category, the most critical thing seen as quantifying the impact of wave climate on coastal dynamics. So that was seen as the most important priority within the five that we identified from the modeling category. In terms of uh, coastal hazards and dynamics, uh, we saw that quantifying future regional and local wave climates was seen as uh, critical, particularly in respect to climate change and what those wave climates might be in the future. In the engineering category, the most important priority was to identify sand sources for beach nourishment, but to also look at the potential impacts of extracting the sand, so what that might mean for coastal dynamics. In terms of the communication and collaboration category, identifying better communication tools, developing better communication tools and citizen science tools for public understanding was seen as uh, the most important and in the infrastructure innovation and funding category, I'll give you one guess as to what the most important priority was seen as, and it was additional funding. Ultimately, it underpins what we do. Uh, 
Now, we've just gone through the top priority in each category, but as I mentioned, some categories ranked more highly than other categories. And so those top priorities in each category were not necessarily the top priorities overall. So when we looked across all the priorities and we combined them together and we did that same approach where we calculated weighted means and we looked at what the average weighted mean was for all the priorities and one standard deviation, we ended up with 11 top priorities. And they, come, they ca uh, came together in a number of themes. So the first was around additional data collection. And this was seen as really critical by a really large number of people. And that included additional topographic data, additional bathymetric data, hydrodynamic data, oceanographic data, and remotely sensed data. So there were a lot of priorities that fit under this additional data collection theme. Within that uh, idea of additional data collection, improved data compilation and access was also seen as really critical. So there were priorities around having a national data custodian and making existing coastal data publicly accessible. That was seen as really critical. Improved understanding of extreme events was seen as really, really important across all the categories, as was the quantification of future impacts of climate change on both dynamics and on our coastal infrastructure. These were also seen as really critical. The two uh, dynamic kind of processes that we look at that were seen as most critical were shoreline change and coastal inundation and doing work to better quantify those two processes was seen as really, really critical. And then the funding was also seen as really critical in terms of the overall priorities that we saw as standing out as the most important from our response, from the community's responses to our surveys. And as I mentioned before, what we saw when we looked at these top priorities, whether they were top priorities within a given category or top priorities overall, was that the ones that ranked most highly had a real breadth of impact across the growth and application of knowledge. So they weren't things that were standalone. So, for example, um, one of the priorities that didn't rank quite so highly was better understanding artificial reef systems. And you can see that that is... While, while it might be a very important thing to do, it doesn't necessarily have as many flow on effects as the priorities that are listed here as the top overall priorities. It's not going to have flow on ramifications for a whole lot of other things that we need to work on. So all these top priorities had a real breadth of impact um, and would also help to develop tools and solutions to address really wide reaching CG problems. So we tended to refer to these as foundational priorities. And in general, we saw that the priorities that kind of met this uh, criteria of having real breadth of impact tended to score the highest. And then the other thing that we saw, and I kind of touched on this in the previous slide, is that these priorities are not independent. If you address one, it has potential flow on impacts for others. And so we sat down and we looked at all these priorities and we actually mapped out how they're all interlinked. And I'll take you through a really simplified uh, version of this diagram, um, but there's a, there's a more detailed version in the paper. So unsurprisingly, most of what we do is underpinned by funding. You know, we, we're, the majority of us here, I suspect, are not doing this of our own funding. We're not independently wealthy. And so you know, we do need funding to do what we do. We need funding to run our computers. We need funding for our field experiments. We need funding to go out and talk to people. And in addition to this, one of the key things that was seen as really important was the removal of barriers that prevent collaboration and coordination. So working on that removal of barriers will also help underpin a lot of what we do. And then there's that data piece, so that novel and expanded data collection, as well as the collation and access. And these three things we sort of saw as being real foundational things that will facilitate all the other things that we identified. So they feed into the rest of the priorities that we identified in the study. And at the kind of um, base of this flowchart of priorities is enhanced process understanding. If we better understand how the systems work, it feeds into a whole bunch of things. And the two, as I mentioned, stand out priorities here, we're looking at coastal erosion and coastal inundation. But linked to that 
is better understanding ecosystem health. And I mentioned earlier the need to understand carbonate production in temperate and tropical reefs and how that will feed into our sediment budgets and things like that. So ecosystem health is tied into our process understanding. An enhanced process understanding will drive improved models for Australia's environments. And the other priority in that space that was seen as really important was making those models and the outputs from those models more accessible to a wider range of people. All of these three things will help us better understand the climate change impacts on lakes and ecosystems. And you'll see that these arrows are not necessarily one way, right? So to understand a better understanding of ecosystem health will help us understand climate change impacts on dynamics, but climate change impacts on dynamics and ecosystems might also help us understand ecosystem help, health. Sorry. So there are a lot of linkages between these different things. When we look at the engineering piece, um, you know, enhanced process understanding and ecosystem help will help us develop novel engineering solutions. And we need to look at the assessed impacts, the costings and the acceptability. And understanding ecosystem health will help us with some of these nature-based solutions that came through as one of the areas that we need to work on. And I should say that not every linkage between the sort of themes and priorities shown here, it gets way too messy if you try and do that. But the key ones are shown here to try to get you, give you a bit of a feel for how interconnected all of these things are. Once we start to have a better understanding of climate change impacts on dynamics and ecosystems and our novel engineering solutions, we can start to look at the impacts of climate change on our communities and on our assets that we have in the coastal region. And then all of these things, these accessible models, our climate change impacts on dynamics, climate change impacts on communities and assets will help us develop enhanced risk assessments. And then from there, we need to work on the associated communication and edu education tools so that our communities can make informed decisions to best manage their coastlines. And ultimately, all of this drives into better adaptation strategies, better decision tools, and better funding models to help coast us manage our coasts as best we can. Now, as part of the second survey, as well as asking people to rank all the priorities, the 74 priorities that we presented to them, we asked people, is there anything we've missed? You know, is there anything that should have been raised in the first survey that wasn't? And when we looked through the responses to that, that, that question, there were four key themes that tended to come out. So the question that we asked was, what additional research activity, activities should we address over the next five to 10 years? And the first theme that came out was around participant diversity. Um, and we have an ongoing need to remove barriers to participation. We saw when we looked at the demographics of the survey respondents for this study that we only have 25% of our coastal geoscience and engineering community who are female. So that's one barrier, but there are other barriers. So there are barriers to people from different cultures. We have barriers around the use of Indigenous knowledge. So we don't necessarily value traditional knowledge as being as valid or as useful as Western knowledge. And so we need to work on this participant diversity to try to get the best out of our community. And we all know that if we have no diverse teams, we end up with better ideas. And so working on participant diversity, as well as just being the right thing to do, will actually drive better outcomes. There were some responses in terms of additional research activities in the communication, collaboration and education space. And one of the things that was uh, most strongly raised was around uh, top down versus bottom up approaches. And there was a general uh, emphasis on the need for more bottom, bottom up approaches. So on the whole in uh, developed countries, we tend to see a more top down approach to things like coastal management because on the whole and in general, our coastal communities tend not to be as engaged as they may be in some of the developing nations where bottom-up approaches tend to be used more often. But as we're starting to see more and more impacts of uh, coastal hazards, more and more impacts from climate change, our communities are starting to become more and more engaged. And so shifting our paradigm so that we use more bottom-up approaches to coastal management I think will really change the way that we manage our kids and result in more tailored solutions to different communities who have different needs and different desires as to how they manage their coasts. 
Another theme that was brought up was the need to learn more from history. So we have a long history of coastal management in Australia. We've not always made sensible decisions. Sometimes we have, sometimes we haven't. But using this history of coastal management to inform our policy and decision-making is a really valuable thing to do because we've, we've got this huge history and we may as well make the most of those learnings that we've had from that history of coastal management. And the last theme that came up in terms of additional research activities was around multidisciplinary approaches. So engaging more with geological knowledge and ecosystem biodiversity and habitat processes and values will help us get a more holistic view of our coastal system, how it might evolve over the long term, and all these interconnections between the geological sphere, the coastal sphere, the coastal geoscience, coastal engineering sphere, as well as our ecosystems and how they're all interconnected and interrelated. So those four themes represent the vast majority of emerging issues that were, uh, were presented to us in the second survey in, in response to that question there. So that's a bit of a summary of what we found from our two surveys and all our analysis from the survey data. So where to from here? Well, the first thing was that the priorities were structured such that they're achievable at the project level. So a small number of researchers or stakeholders in a sort of three to five year time frame. So the first and most obvious thing to do is to actually start addressing some of these priorities. So picking out a few that are of interest to you, of interest to your colleagues, and going, actually, we're going to try and address this. It's also worth noting that these priorities represent the views of our coastal geoscience and engineering community in Australia at a single instance in time. Now, while we wouldn't necessarily think that these uh, priorities would change radically over the short to medium term, I think it's probably worth us redoing this survey in a sort of five to 10 year period to see if views have shifted, if our priorities have shifted, you know, are the number one priorities from this survey still number one in five to 10 years? Or are there other emerging priorities that we really need to capture and shift our research direction towards? I think the priorities that we've presented here have the potential to inform the development of a national coastal research program for Australia in terms of having a real dedicated uh, resource that is trying to answer these questions that we've seen the community identify as most critical. Um, you know, these are not the views of the authors of this paper. We all only got one vote in the final voting as well. So, you know, this really does represent a, um, a view of the community and what people think is most important. Um, and really, ultimately, I hope that these priorities provide a perspective that allows us to have a more strategic approach to funding coastal geoscience and engineering research. We're working in a resource limited environment. There is only so much time, only so many people and only so much research funding. And so we really want to make the best use of it. We want to make sure that it, our research funding, our time, our effort goes towards addressing these priorities that are the most important and are the ones that are going to have the most impact because we've seen the impacts of climate change. We know we need to do something about this. So if we work together and use the information from this survey, we can hopefully have better outcomes as a result of our coastal geoscience and engineering research in Australia. And that's all I have to say today. I would encourage you to read the full paper, which is Open Access in Frontiers in Marine Science. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or I'd love to have a bit of a discussion about the paper if there's time. Thanks.